Fine Green Institute manual. Um, it's available in the uh, in the church library in the, uh, the gospel library. The gospel library. Okay. But also, also Saints Volume One. Um, the good thing about Saints is that it's so easy to read. It doesn't follow a chronology like we're doing because it jumps around through stories. So sometimes it can be complicated for to use as a lesson manual. But you will love you will love connecting those stories to the things that are going on that we are talking about the the broader platform of the restoration. Is this institute manual one of them you wrote? Um. <laughs> wow! Did you hear that, all you other mothers? <laughs> here's, here's the deal with writing church curriculum. You write and you write and you write and then you send it to a committee and they write and rewrite and they send it to a committee and they write and they send it back to you and you rewrite and and then it goes to correlation and they reject the whole thing. <laughs> so when whenever on any of the uh, institute curricula that I ever had a, a part of, of writing, sometimes I go through that and I just find this sentence and it's like, ooh, ooh that was mine. <laughs> but the sentence usually says, Elder Dallin A. chokes with the form of the 12 apostles. <laughs> All right. We do, have a, we do have a lot to get through. Uh, and today's lesson, I really want to hustle because it kind of needs to be kept together. Um, we talked about going to the Ohio for two reasons. The Lord said that he wanted us to go to the Ohio because there he would give us his law and there he would endow us from on high. Um, today we are going to talk about receiving that law. So we've got to set ourselves up in the context and get ourselves into the right place. Joseph Smith arrives in Kirtland in February. He and Sidney Rigdon are, in that, are the first ones to get there of, of all the, the immigrants. They just take off by themselves, travel light. They get there, uh, they travel overland. Uh, they get there in February. Between February and April, they are staying here in Newell Whitney's house in this very crowded house. In fact, they're staying here in this, this one room of that crowded house. And uh, during this time, uh, Elsa Johnson is healed from her, the rheumatism in her arm, and Joseph Smith receives several sections of the Doctrine and Covenants, including the one that is, is labeled as the Law of the Lord, section 42. Those 40s are great, aren't they? The, the reading your Doctrine and Covenants of the, the 40s about gifts of the Spirit and about the law of the Lord. This is as small as you can see. It, it, it's a poor picture, but if you're standing in one corner to take a picture of the other corner of this bedroom where Joseph and Emma have made their home, Emma being uh, significantly pregnant by the end of their time there, they, they are kind of, they're kind of nudged out not only by the crowd, but also because Newell's aunt, uh, who is, who is anti-clerical, is also living in the home. Uh, she just doesn't like organized religion, including young Joseph and Emma, and she, she kind of edges them out. So they move on to the Morley farm, where uh, they move into a cabin. This, this is not the cabin, but when you Google search Ohio cabins 1830s, you, I got this one. And I liked it because it's in the trees, and, and, and one must imagine what that little Whitney complex was. It's the same place where, uh, remember, Sister Whitney lived the whole time that, that uh, or not Sister Whitney, Sister uh, Morley lived the whole time while her husband was in the War of 1812, just alone in the woods. By this time, they built a small complex of cabins and are, are living communally and Joseph moves into one of these cabins. Significant events there is that Emma gives birth to their twins, Thaddeus and Louisa. These sweet babies live only a few hours when, when they are taken uh, to wait for their parents in, in the celestial world. But uh, we know that story. That is a significant story in church history and only in most of my conversations, I have heard the sympathy and the empathy for Emma. And, and people always look at the Emma Smith story and they say, well, look at this life that she led. And I testify of the pain of Joseph. My, 
son and daughter-in-law have suffered through several miscarriages, oh, so and it has been harder on my son than it has been on my daughter-in-law. And everybody's focused on the daughter-in-law, but the son really needed some comfort. I'm, I know that that's true, and I'm sorry for him. The, uh, the divine blessing in this was that John Murdoch's wife had passed in delivering their twins only a, a short time before. And so Joseph and Emma adopt Joseph Smith Murdoch and Julia Murdoch as their, uh, as their own children. And they raise that, uh, they, well, you know that, that the young son will pass away, but uh, the, the daughter grows to maturity and cares for Emma in her old age. And what a sweet, what a sweet soul. But uh, so the rest of the saints start moving. The Fayette group, so this is the Whitmers and the Jollies and, and that whole core, that whole central New York core of Latter-day Saints, like a third of the church. They take the Erie Canal to Buffalo. They board a ship in Buffalo. Uh, and all along, Lucy leading this group is uh, has been having quite overt devotionals. Do you know this story? She, it's, it's in Lucy Mack Smith's biography of Joseph Smith that she, she leads the saints from the Fayette group in song and prayer and spiritual experiences and right on the deck of the boat. And I would like to uh, just pose this question. We won't stay here for very long, but this is May of 1831. The church is one year old. And what we notice, we notice a significant church leader is a woman leading a, a mixed gender group, right? And why does she get to be the leader? Because she led. I, I, I think sometimes, I'm, and this is my little tirade on this, sometimes in the church, we are waiting for Tinkerbell to come touch us with her magic wand so that we can feel like we can, you know, put up the chairs after conference. <laughs> who gets to lead in the kingdom of God? Someone who will lead. And oft times that, that can be and should be a woman, <clears throat> Sister Smith, and she doesn't have to wait around for the Whitmers to take charge. She can stand up and say, let's get on the boat and let's sing. Can I have an amen? Amen. <laughs> I, have, I have in my, uh, my network of, of called institute teachers, two sisters who are returned mission leaders who have served in the mission field with their husbands. And I've asked them specifically to be mission prep teachers to young, young single adults so that those 18-year-old uh, boys learn that it's okay to take instruction from a, from a woman in authority. And so those 19-year-old uh, sisters know that it's okay to be in charge. Which is, but, but not, not me, right? You can be in charge of me when you can wrestle me down. <laughs> it's funny. Come on, that's funny. Sisters, we got a room full of one women. <laughs> Should have had a lot more laughter at that sarcasm. I think we could all take it. <laughs> right? And, and you don't have to go far. When I was living in Wyoming, our next door neighbor church, right? The branch president from Wamsutter moved away. And, and the church was run by a, a sister for a while. Yeah, I. I I had a whole bunch of Pauline's in that little branch, but um, they couldn't find anybody to be Sunday school for the president. So they asked President Covey if it would be okay if I did it. So he said, fine. Fine. <laughs> that is right. Handbook's <laughs> only a bunch of suggestions. So, uh... <laughs> oh, by the way, by the way, they arrive in, they arrive in Fairport, uh, near Cleveland on the, uh, on the Erie. Uh, on Lake Erie on the 11th of May, 1831. Sister Smith's grand story is how the Colesville group that was traveling with them did not want to participate 
in, in the religious events. They didn't want to look Mormon on these boats. And so while, while Sister Smith is on the deck of the ship praying and singing, uh, the, uh, the knights and everybody go, uh, go and get lodging and just kind of keep to themselves. And Sister Smith tells the story that uh, while they are on the boat one day, the ice breaks and clears and the, the steamer shoves off from port and they get out into uh, fresh or into open water in the lake and the ice closes back in and so they are able to arrive in Ohio on the 11th of May while the uh, the night group was left behind <laughs> while Newell leading his group same group Erie Canal to Buffalo but they took lodging and they got to Ohio on the 14th of May 1831 <laughs> Lucy makes such a big deal about the Lord blessed us and we got there sooner. Three days. <laughs> you got, there, you got there three days sooner and you had to sleep on a deck. So, not a bad call, Newell. Next page. Remember how we left this? What about the spiritual conditions in Ohio? We haven't resolved the idea of false spirits that have gone abroad deceiving men. That's the Lord's words, by the way, out of section 50, right? Uh, some are of men, some are of God, some are of the devil. That's Joseph Smith's words. John Whitmer, who we originally quoted when, when John said, I got here and things were not edifying. And he said, these things grieved the servants of the Lord. Some conversed together on the subject and others came in and we were at Joseph Smith Jr. the Sears and made it a matter of consultation. For many would not turn from their folly unless God would give a revelation. Party, who is there, says, Feeling our weakness and inexperience, unless we should err in judgment concerning these spiritual phenomena, myself, John Murdoch, and several other elders went to see Joseph Smith and asked him to inquire of the Lord concerning these spirits or, or manifestations. I like the party two things. Number one, he's, he's kind of like uh, Gamaliel. Who says, let's not let's not throw these Christians out because if they're right, we don't want to fight against God, and if they're wrong, they'll just evaporate. But uh, party says we don't want to err. Maybe, you know, maybe we're the ones that don't get this, which I I love that open mindedness. That that just because somebody's not doing it my way, it, I might be the one that's wrong. But secondly, he he, does, he says their spirits or manifestations. He's not so much um, giving us to believe that that the devil and his minions are, are inhabiting or influencing, only that people are behaving in a way that is maybe not edifying. Uh, listen to this next paragraph. After we had joined in prayer in his translating room, he dictated in our presence the following revelation. It says, party, each sentence was uttered slowly and very distinctly, and with a pause between each, sufficiently long for it to be recorded by an, or by an ordinary writer in longhand. To, to my knowledge, this is the first time somebody says this is what it was like when Joseph got a revelation. And it happened in our presence, and he dictated it, and we have it in section 50 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Among other things, this section teaches us, hearken, O ye elders of my church, and give ear to the voice of the living God, and attend to the words of wisdom which shall be given unto you according as ye have asked and are agreed as touching this church and the spirits which have gone abroad in the earth. Behold, verily I say unto you that there are many spirits which are false spirits which have gone forth in the earth deceiving the world. And also Satan has sought to destroy you that he might overthrow you. First three verses out of that section teach us. Let's see if uh, class... Give me three things out of three verses. They don't have to be one per verse. Just three things out of three verses. Satan wants to deceive you. It is wise for us to know that our enemy is actively trying to bring us down. Right? We, I don't know why we would think we are somehow immune from, from deception, hardship, or, or sorrows from the devil because, because our, of our covenants. He actively wants to bring us down. And knowing that it is him, 
knowing that it is him gives us a power uh, to overcome. That's a good one, Lynette. I like that. Anybody else? Two more. Well, I think of the first one, give heed to the elders of the church, and I think of that today. You know what? Listen to the prophet. And, uh, you know, I always think of that song, listen to the prophet, and he'll lead the way. And sometimes it might be not something you agree with, but it's his voice. There is, there is a cool thing on that that we notice in this section. Joseph receives the revelation, but why does he get this revelation from verse 1? As ye have asked and are agreed. The unity of the elders that have come together in council has authorized Joseph Smith to receive revelation. Councils, councils, councils. Council of the First Presidency, Council of the Twelve, Quorums of the Seventy, uh, Elders Quorums, Bishoprics, Primary Presidencies, Missionary Companionships, Husbands and Wives. The Lord has put us in, in councils so that we can come to him in unity and open the gates of revelation. That was a good one. Carolee? I was going to say, it says there are many spirits and that they've deceived the world. I think both of those are significant. Was that a bad answer? No, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, to decide, <laughs> trying to decide whether or not... I. Because I've, I've been working a model through in my mind that I don't think is a fair platform for teaching yet. I don't want anybody to be offended. But let me just, I'll, I'll show you what I was working in my mind. I would have written on the board, uh, MAGA and woke. And what, what I would do, what I would do is ask you to tell me, just depending on which way you feel about the world, what is wrong with each one of those definitions. And then, and then, as we dissect it, we would discover that sometimes we have called good evil because of which column it's in. And sometimes we've called evil good because of which column it's in. And there are many false spirits which have gone abroad deceiving the world, right? Calling good evil and evil good. And since we know that, that Satan is actively trying to deceive us, We've got to know, we've got to know that our column is not, is not 100% pure. What were the two columns? These bears. No. No. Megan. Megan? Megan. 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 Make America Great Again. Oh, Red House, yeah. Donald Trump, or, or Woke, you know. Puerto Rican congresswomen shaking their fists. <laughs> All right, next, next, next. I want two quotes from Joseph Smith, and I want us to think about them, about what they teach us. Can somebody give us this first quote, if you can see uh, through the glares? Who, who will read, will you read this first one, Val, will you read the second one that comes up? Many we have reason to fear, having a zeal not according to knowledge, not understanding the pure principles of the doctrine of the church, have no doubt in the heat of enthusiasm taught and said many things which are derogatory to the genuine character and principles of the church. And for these things, which are heartily sorry, for these things we are heartily sorry and would apologize if an apology would do any good. What can we learn about dealing with mistakes by examining Joseph Smith's reaction to the Kerland enthusiasm? Well, that he's admitting humanism. He's a, we're, well, that he's human. And that we all are. Yeah. We're all human. Even these people that he had to correct, and the Lord told him he had to correct, and the Lord told him that were, there were many false spirits gone abroad in the land deceiving the world. Joseph says they were, uh, they were a zeal not according to knowledge. They, they overreacted. And we made a mistake. From our first prophet, he says, we were trying, we made mistakes, and I would apologize if an apology would do any good. I would love to have this tattooed on the forehead of every Latter-day Saint. 
just so that we can, when people are mad at us, we could just say, I would apologize, and an apology would do any good. <laughs> I love that he says, you know, in zeal to do, to do good, really. They were trying to, trying their best. Right. We, we ought to cut ourselves, we ought to cut our friends, we ought to cut our, our ancestors a lot of slack in their zeal uh, beyond their knowledge. Next quote. The branch of the church in this part of the Lord's vineyard, which had increased in nearly, to nearly 100 members, were striving to do the will of God as far as they knew it. Though some strange notions and false spirits had crept in among them, with a little caution and some wisdom, I soon assisted the brethren and sisters to overcome them. The plan of common stock which had existed in what was called the family whose members generally had embraced the everlasting gospel was readily abandoned for the more perfect law of the Lord and the false spirits were easily discerned and rejected by the light of revelation Joseph Smith. what attributes of Jesus Christ are demonstrated by Joseph Smith in this instance by the way Joseph Smith addresses these two problems how, how is he mirroring the Savior I think he's understanding the intent and the heart of the people. Do you trust that the Savior understands our intent and our heart? I do too. What, are, what other insights might you get? A little caution and some wisdom. He used caution and wisdom in correction. Caution and wisdom. My goodness. Try, try thinking through the last time you had to correct somebody because they didn't load the dishwasher properly or they uh, weren't uh, returning your call for your insurance reimbursement or, or they had pulled you over for uh, 85 in a school zone. <laughs> and you need to correct them. A little caution and some wisdom. A little caution and some wisdom would stop me who 85% of the time in offering correction. It would it would caution me and make me wise enough to just warn the unruly, comfort the feeble minded, and support the weak. Any others? Don't we have have this problem today in the church? Oh my goodness. I worked in confidential tithing under Marvin J. Ashton and I'd only been been a member of the church for two years. And he came in one day, and he was so dang on me that I went and hid in the bathroom until after he left. <laughs> he was a little scary. And my supervisor said, he's just a man. He probably didn't sleep last night. Just do your job. But in my mind, I was going, this guy's an apostle. What the heck is going on here? You know, I, I think it's what keeps me from idolizing the leadership in the church. I know a lot of people think President Dorf is like the rock god of the church. And um, <laughs> I, I'm just saying that's what I'm trying to call him. And um, I just don't feel that way because in my mind, I always think of Elder Ashton and him coming in and scaring the crap out of me. <laughs> we all have, <coughs> I don't know if it's people challenges or Satan challenges or what, but he could have gone inactive after that little episode. <coughs> I think of Elder Dorf when he was um, it, it left me. I'm oh, sorry. But it was a good time. Yeah. <laughs> Elder Holland, when he made the remark about I wish that would be where you were where you used to be and that just went viral. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even get an explanation of what he wanted so to do. I think it was about the gay issue or something. But, but in all these things, we know this problem. And and it's it's manifest by the way I asked the question. My question wasn't to idolize Joseph Smith even. Or, or uh, see him as anything more than Joseph Smith, this guy. But I told you to look at Joseph Smith and see a, a reflection of Christ. Well, and, and his humility. You know, 
I told him what it was. And they did. Is not how he approached it's it. Not how he approached it. And uh, yeah, when uh, my mom's cousin worked with President Nelson before, right when he was called to be an apostle, and um, the next Monday morning, like he did all his surgeries that he had scheduled, and so the next Monday morning they're at work, and he comes and he's scrubbing next to her, and he says, "So how's it going, Sister Wooten? Do you still have a testimony?" <laughs> <laughs> The last thing that I will point out. Like, yeah. Thank you. The last thing I'd like to point out is, is how Joseph Smith felt about these two big problems. I, I really do love this. What did John Whitmer say? Oh no, the sky is falling. Uh, Ezra Booth in the newspaper, Mormons are crazy. Party beef brat, this isn't even the church I left. Uh, Joseph Smith says, oh, it was easily discerned. The spirits were easily discerned and rejected by the light of revelation. We fixed it. No big whoop. Can we start looking at church, personal, ecclesiastical, family problems, and just recognize that they are just problems? They are just problems that are easily discerned by revelation and uh, rejected by the light. It's just... It's, it's like the old adage of the person who stands outside shivering and says, I'm so cold. And the other guy goes in the house and gets a coat. <laughs> right? Stand out, oh, it's getting so dark. And the other lady turns on a light switch. Yes, it's a problem. I can fix this. What were you going to say? I was just going to ask where what it was referencing was the common stock and the family. Great question. So we resolved the false spirits. The common stock in the family was Isaac Morley's commune of, of you know, the, the ten, 10 or so cabins he had on his hundred acre farm, and the families that were on that farm had all thrown in together in common stock. And, uh, yeah, the, the disciples had all things in common, but having all things in common, they were going to destruction very fast as to terrible things. For they considered from reading the scripture that what belonged to a brother belonged to any of the brethren. Therefore, they would take each other's clothes and other property and use it without leave, which brought on confusion and disappointment, for they did not understand the scripture. They're reading the same book of Acts that everybody's reading, that, that says that the saints had all things in common. And they know there are poor people, and they know Jesus wants pe poor people to be helped. So, uh, having more zeal than knowledge, They've gone forward to try to create this utopian society where everybody can uh, can live in peace and harmony. Here's kind of a map of where, where it was. Today, there's, it, there's just an open field where this area was. But he had a little commune of cabins and a, and a pretty decent sized farm for the day that the, uh, the road where it trails off and comes together crossing the river is where New Whitney's store was. So we're just outside of Kirkland, right? Um, and so as part of the law of the Lord, uh, with, with the new light, the common stock was forsaken, and the Lord's law was embraced. And what I want to talk about for the rest of the lesson is that, that the common stock was a mistake. I think, I think the vast majority of the time that I talk to a Latter-day Saint about the law of consecration and stewardship, they have it pictured in their mind, some sort of law of common stock, not realizing that that was the wrong way to do it. So let's, let's take an examination. First principle, we gotta reject the world. I'll give you, I'll give you 50 points for any of these uh, famous pictures you can recognize. Yeah, J.P. Morgan said, <laughs> this is a fake quote, but from the famous financier, this will just be a free ride for the lazy and undeserving. <laughs> Sounds like J.P. Morgan. Wrong. How about this guy? John C. Calhoun, uh, Democrat, South Carolina. <laughs> the, uh, the great, great, great protagonist of states' rights. I hope he gets out of hell sometime. He may, have, he may have said, 
All men are created equal. Some are more equal than others. I don't want the others touching my stuff. <laughs> oh, sorry, Brother Calhoun. How about this guy? This is Charles Darwin. He's not even born yet, but she, it. she, she gets mirror. her point. The weak and the slow must perish so the greater group can become stronger. If you're not smart enough to get a good job, if you're not a hard enough worker to put in the extra hours, you, you deserve to be poor. And your poverty is just going to make all the rest of us faster. The lions will get you. Nope, that, that's wrong, Brother Darwin. I got it. Oh no, wait, Scrooge. Ah. Minus a thousand for Linda. That's somebody else's problem, the poor and the needy. So we've got four false doctrines and some wisdom. Beware, pride, envy, greed, and selfishness of the dark side are they. <laughs> you ever, you ever just? I, I invite you to just sit and meditate on the seven deadly sins sometime. I, I think a lot of times, you know, we we scold people over their pornography addictions because we say lust is one of the seven deadly sins. Well, it's one of them. And it is deadly. But we fail to take into account at the same time pride, greed, selfishness, laziness. You want an easy way to remember the seven deadly sins, by the way? Just think of Gilligan's <laughs> Island. <laughs> the professor always was the smartest. He represents pride. Mr. and Mrs. Howell, greed and gluttony. <laughs> Um, Marianne, envy, ginger, lust, the skipper, wrath, Gilligan, sloth. <laughs> oh, those seven castaways taught us a deeper lesson. <laughs> but wouldn't it be a thing if we were as, as worried about about greed and gluttony, greed and selfishness in our lives as we reject Morgan, Calhoun, Darwin, and McDuck. So the Lord gives us a commandment in his law. Right off the top of his law, he says, thou wilt remember the poor, the commandment, which is backed up, backed up through the doctrine and covenants uh, I gave three scriptures out of the Book of Mormon. I could have just put the Book of Mormon. If, if, if you gave yourself, you give yourself you know, a drinking challenge, have a sip of Diet Coke every time that the Book of Mormon talks about fine twine linen and costly, costly clothing, you, uh, I don't know, you finish whole Coke, I don't know. But the Book of Mormon is full of, uh, of, of statements against wealth and extravagance. And full of invitations to care for the poor and the needy. And then the Book of Mor and the Doctrine and Covenants through the Restoration, the Lord just keeps drilling down on that. Care for the poor and needy. Care for the poor and needy. Care for the poor and needy. So it's, it's hard to blame Brother, uh, Brother Morley as he tries to set up a system to care for the poor and the needy. A common stock arrangement where everyone in the community owns all material property in common. In other words, and, and this is the way I heard it explained in a, a, in a priesthood meeting one time. When we live the law of consecration, I'll be able to come use your snowmobile. <laughs> what, what have we learned about the uh, common stock? It's, it's not true. So let's try another model. <clears throat> Who's this guy? That's Carl, yeah. Carl Marx, who said. Maybe consecration should be a political theory where all property is publicly owned and the workers are paid according to their abilities and needs. In other words, why don't we give everything we have to the church and then the bishop will dish out to us what we want and need? Uh, how many of you have ever heard the law of consecration and stewardship described like that? Carl? 
Not true. <laughs> We've got to find a different definition then. How about Carl's brother? <laughs> <laughs> the law of consecration is a, a communitarian higher law that the saints are not capable of living now, but will be required to live one day. How many of you have heard that one? The law of consecration is the higher law. If that one drives me crazy, because if that's the case, we as a people, we've only been savable while our numbers were under 100 to about 1835. And every Latter-day Saint since 1835 has been wandering in the wilderness like the like the Hebrews in Sinai. And yet we still covenant to keep the law of consecration in the temple. How about that? So, Groucho, no. <laughs> However, let's remember that amongst the rules, we've got to also remember that idleness and, and envy uh, and other things of the dark side are they. Yeah. So, to consecrate. To consecrate doesn't mean to give to the church. To consecrate literally is Latin to make something sacred, to dedicate something to the service of deity. So bear that definition in mind. To dedicate something to the service of deity. There are three eternal principles that we learn from the scriptures that must be met by the Lord's standard of consecration. Principle number one. Consecration, the law of consecration and stewardship exists to care for the poor and the needy. Uh, we won't go through all the doctrine and covenant scriptures that prove that, but will you trust me? The Lord says, consecrate thy good to care for the poor and the needy. Number two, the consecration is to provide for the temporal needs of the Lord's church, including in Kirtland and to this very day, building the house of the Lord. That was going to take a lot of capital, which the poor <laughs> saints did not have without some sort of resource pooling. And third, the law of consecration and stewardship exists to help the rich or the prosperous not succumb to the curses and the rich of the riches of the world. Yoda, Yoda told us that, that at least three, three quarters of the, uh, of the seven deadly sins revolve around prosperity, right? But I still got to take care of the poor. I still got to provide the temporal needs of the church. There's something, I don't know if there's something in you guys, but in me, I came home from Peru living amongst the, the poorest of the poor and just having a revulsion to prosperity. And that's why I went into education. So <laughs> I went into religious education. Well, you know, it's interesting. You wouldn't remember this because you were too young, but most of the people here that. For a long time, uh, we had a building fund. Like yeah. we have tithing and fast offering, we had a building fund that we had to contribute to every and month. And the budget. Part yeah. of the budget, yeah. Oh. I know. And, and we look at it from a financial perspective, but our time and our talents are just as important. So glad you brought that up, and I, we've got to get to that. A steward. A steward is a property guard. A, a person who is responsible for managing another person's property. So uh, my brother has a steer that is, is in the feedlot at my house. I feed it every day. I am the steward of that animal. I'm not the owner of that animal. I'm, I'm the steward, right? But it, as a good steward, I'm taking good care of his animal uh, and, and better care of my dad's six bulls that are in the feedlot because he, he pays better for stewardship. There are three principles of stewardship. To abolish the curse, every time I raise my hand, she thinks I have curiosity. To abolish the curse of idleness. 100% idleness is condemned in the Doctrine and Covenants. Stewardship exists to require all people to be agents who act and not objects who are acted upon. 
Stewardship exists so that we make decisions that have real consequences. Otherwise, our decision making is irrelevant. And that's the plan of salvation, right? So you've got to be able in stewardship and consecration to make a decision that leads to growth or leads to, uh, to collapse. It's your call. And it's got to exalt the poor. The Lord repeatedly talks about, uh, about lowering the rich, or in other words, humbling the rich so they're not hurt by the, uh, by the vices of prosperity. But it's also to exalt the poor through hard work, initiative, and self-reliance. That's how, that's how the poor are elevated according to the scriptures. All right, any questions? Now, the next part of the slideshow, I may just sit down because it's just so entertaining. <laughs> so let's, let's look and see how this would play out. So there's a guy, it's got 100 barren acres and, it, and his home, and uh, let's, give him, let's give him 10 cows. What, uh, Brother Morning, how much of this property does the member consecrate? Consecrate to make something sacred, dedicated to the service of deity. He makes all of it is holy. Every one of his cows are respectively holy cows. Right? That are weeks and weeks in advance. But how much does he donate to the church? Whatever has been decided between him and the bishop. In the modern church, that decision has been 10%. Please, 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 let's not say tithing is a lesser law for the law of consecration. Tithing is, tithing is an aspect of the law of consecration and stewardship. It's the way we give to the bishop. And what are his jobs? Care for the poor and the needy. Build the, to build the church, to see that the saints are not destroyed by the curses of, of prosperity, right? So, uh, guy's still left with nine cows and 90 acres. Uh, why doesn't the bishop ask for all of it? He just off the lip. Right? I once thought I would like to be like Father Francisco Kino, who was a Franciscan friar who settled uh, missions all around the. Uh, the uh, Northwest United States, and when he died, he owned a saddle and his reading glasses. And I just thought, wouldn't that be, that be nice to just live that simple? Well, he, he had to live like a beggar. Somebody had to feed him. He, he had to, he, if I gave everything I have to the bishop and say, Bishop, I love the Lord so much. Here's all my stuff. Now, will you please take care of my family? Yeah. <laughs> he would excommunicate me on the spot. <laughs> That's not, that's not the Lord's consecration. He would keep, he would keep a portion. Now, uh, what's the responsibility of a faithful steward? To take care of the rest of Take care of those nine cows. And if you take care of nine cows, which, which are holy cows, <laughs> take good care of them, even though they stay in your barn, from nine cows, you should get nine more cows next year. That's how it works. I'm leaving out some of the biology, but don't worry about it. <laughs> but he should also improve his land and milk the cows. So as a good steward at the end of the year, uh, he has multiplied the harvest. So he's able to give the bishop a surplus. <clears throat> you see? What started with handing over a cow and 10 acres, now he's giving, he's giving more commodities and he's giving on a regular basis. And he keeps the rest, and what does he do with it? <coughs> um, right there. He markets it. Why is he marketing it? <laughs> to make money. I did not know that you could profit while living the law of consecration and stewardship. And the answer is, you have to. Or if you can't profit or fail from these stewardship decisions, you are not acting in agency, right? 
There has to be real choice with real consequences that a person chooses between so that they can be an agent and not an object, which is the nature of the whole plan of salvation. Right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> you and me, we're right. <laughs> so he takes some for his family, he sells the rest, he gives some to the bishop. Um, he gives the bishop what's required, takes care of his family, manages his stewardship. So he, uh, he invests his stewardship, cha-ching, he gets 10 acres back. Now he's got, he got more land, he can run more cows, boom. He gets more corn, more milk, more cheese, and he continues to grow in his stewardship. And every time he grows in his stewardship, he's able to make a, uh, a better contribution to the kingdom. Eventually, eventually, he's got a nice farm. Can you, can you see the pig? Where's the pig? <laughs> he's diversified. He's got pigs. He's got sheep. You probably didn't notice this, but this is also deliberate. The sheep are out. <laughs> <laughs> there are two kinds of sheep. Lost sheep and sheep about to be lost. <laughs> and I 100% believe that that's why the Lord chose the metaphor. <laughs> Let's check our principles. Let's check our principles of uh, consecration and stewardship, see if they've been met. Have we, in stewardship, does this model abolish the curse of idleness? Yes. Does it provide for all people to be agents rather than objects? And has it exalted the poor through hard work, initiative, and self-reliance? Stewardship works. Now let's check out, oh, this man, this farmer's a good and faithful steward of his property for the Lord. Ah, I, I rewrote that a couple times because I first wrote, he's a faithful steward of the Lord's property. And I thought, well, no, that's not true. He's a faithful steward of his property for the Lord, right? In the name of the Lord, he, he he's become a holy farmer of holy cows, but he owns the deed to those cows. He's the one who's responsible if those cows get out. You know, his cows don't get out, and he says, Lord, your cows have wandered off. Thou art a poor fence builder. No. But he, is, he has taken it as his sacred responsibility to multiply his herd. It's not just an accident. It's not just good business. It is his sacred responsibility. Now let's talk about the, the, the consecration. Let's talk about what's wound up in the bishop's storehouse. The bishop then is able to take some of that and he gives it to a guy who's got nothing. And so he gives him enough 10 acre pieces and some milk and cheese for him to feed his family and a few cows so that he can get his seed money. And what's the invitation to this guy now? I've given you five cows. Next spring? You should have five more. You should have five calves. And I've given you uh, 10 bushel of, of corn and, and uh, 50 acres. Every corn seed you plant should become a corn stalk with multiple ears of corn and multiple seeds, right? You multiply this harvest. This should make complete sense to us. The Lord has been teaching us this since the beginning when he, when he said, so once upon a time there was a guy who had uh, some money and he gave his money to his servants. And one servant went out and invested it and one servant went out and doubled it and the other servant did nothing. Right? The Lord is teaching us teaching us to be good stewards, to take what he gives us and do better with it. He takes the rest of it, or he takes some of it, and he sells it. <clears throat> He's got to sell it because one of his responsibilities as bishop is to supply the church with capital funds. He's got to have cashola to pay temple builders, <laughs> right? And building the temples. So we've got to worry about that. Lastly, there's going to be some surplus. Let's not forget that the bishop himself is under responsibility to be a wise steward of the Lord's property. So he's got to uh, show initiative. He's got to show hard work. He's got to show thrift and responsibility. 
as he is accountable for this extra that he saves for the rainy day. He's got to save something to buy more pieces of property in Missouri so we can have more Zions. We're, our, there's, a, there's our time, but can you give me like three more, four more slides? Because the principles. By this model, have we cared for the poor and the needy? By this model, have we provided for the temporal needs of the Lord's church, including the construction of the Lord's house? By this model, do we help the rich not succumb to the curses of, riches, of the riches of the world? We've provided a platform. The decision of their agency is up to them. And by the way, the way you can tell if somebody is rich, if anybody's house is smaller than mine, they're not working hard enough and they should get more education and a better job. If anybody's house is bigger than me, they're extravagant uh, <laughs> spendthrifts, and they're probably going to hell. <laughs> We've abolished the curse of idleness. We've uh, required people to be agents. And we provided a way for the poor to be exalted through hard work initiative and self-reliance. The law of consecration and stewardship works. Now, we have tried it in different models. We tried it with the United Firm in Kirkland, which had, had some difficulties, but mostly because of an economic uh, depression in the 1830s. We tried it in, uh, in Utah with the, uh, the cooperatives, which, which had m some success, but in, a, in the long run wound up to be uh, monopolies that created unfair business and kind of uh, made it more difficult to run business. And we've tried the law of tithing. Thanks, President Snow. President Snow's emphasis on the law of tithing, by the way, wasn't start paying your tithing. It was start paying tithing in capital. Let's not come and, and drop a bushel of potatoes off at the bishop anymore, because that's fast offerings. What we need is silver and gold that we can pay off the Gentiles who, who owned us in the 1890s. So, the law of consecration and stewardship works, and it's working. Let's have two, because, because our time is short. But what does the law of the Lord, as we revealed to the Kirtland saints, teach you about the Lord? What are his values? What are his priorities? What are, what are the things he's thinking about as he teaches the saints the law of consecration and stewardship? Think of others. Think of others. He's speaking about individuals and their particular circumstances. The needs of individuals. I was going to say it, it includes all of us because I think we all feel poor and we all recognize that we're rich in different aspects. And and uh, I think we I think it's nice to recognize that wherever we are, this will help us that we will need to sacrifice, that we will need to do something to put the Lord first and other people first. How does the Lord feel about pride, greed, selfishness, sloth, envy? He's against it. <laughs> I, shouldn't, I should have waited for your answer. <laughs> How can a person apply this pattern of consecration and stewardship in the real world without cows? And we already had our lead in, right? So what do you do with your time? How much of your time is consecrated? Flash back to our cows. How much time is consecrated? My life, my life is the Lord's. My life is a holy life. Every minute of my life is consecrated. How much does the Lord need into his storehouse? That is varied. That's, that was different when I was a full-time missionary. It was different when I was a bishop. It was different when I was in a state presidency. It, uh, it, it's different depending on what we are called to do. And what are we called to do? Receive a stewardship and grow it. So with your time, every second that is left to you after church attendance and scripture study and ministering visits and presidency meetings, what's your responsibility with all the rest of your time that has not been explicitly given to the Lord? Magnify it. There's a sentence Brigham Young would use in talks that I love. He, 
he would get up at the end of a service and say, there is time remaining that should be improved. And then he'd give a talk. Because his point was, let's not waste our time. Let's, let's talk about the gospel. Let's do something significant. Let's, let's read a book. Let's do a workout. Let's call a friend. Let's take a nap. Let's do the thing, do the thing that is going to make us good stewards. What about our talents? Same things. Think about whatever skills you get got. Not just piano, playing the piano or juggling, but like, what if what if someone was like good at coaching? Thank you, Andy Reid. Brother Reid. <laughs> That coaching is a holy thing. I'm, I'm kind of making life, but mostly not. A consecrated person's profession is holy. Well, it's not really godly. He plays on Sunday and all that, all that sort of stuff. So what's taken into the storehouse? Well, he goes to church on the off season. What's he supposed to do? He's supposed to win another Super Bowl. <laughs> if, if you're a doctor, you become a steward by becoming a better doctor every time you walk into a, uh, into a surgery. You become better at your craft, not worse, not atrophy. You cultivate your practice, you cultivate your farm, you build up your family because this is a holy job. We are consecrated stewards of the Lord's, uh, Lord's vineyard. Thanks for being here today. My faith and my testimony is that we are absolutely living this law and not waiting for some grand day for the Lord to restart, restore a higher law and we can all go back and live like it was in Kirtland, except with flushing toilets. <laughs> we, we continue to follow the Lord. He leads us, he guides us, he corrects us when necessary, and he doesn't move us backwards. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. I'm going to sit and pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the opportunity that you've got us to be able to attend this class and, and to learn. And we thank you for our Brother Reed and his time and effort to, and his study and magnifying his talent so that he can teach us. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we may carry on with the things that we've learned today, that we may become better stewards and, and better servants of thee. Again, we thank you for the blessing and ask thee to be with us that we may have thy spirit to guide us and direct us in our decisions. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. 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 Thanks, Mom. Woo, that was 57 a slides, good one. Everybody. That was good. Good. It, uh, you I am seven minutes over. Uh, if you're late, your next thing I'll give you a note. <laughs> <laughs> Which I can because I'm kind of a big deal. <laughs> no, no, no. Modesty is run in the Reese family. You don't want to write the life of Joe and Emma. And the group had I can tell. I think that means that you can never do that. Surely.